Committee will come to order. Today, the Senate Judiciary Committee considers the issue of Supreme Court ethics reform. Being a federal judge is a position of great honor and power, but above all, it is public service. We entrust judges with administering equal justice under the law. It is critical to our democracy that the American people have confidence that judges cannot be bought or influenced and that they are serving the public interest, not their own personal interest. Over the course of several decades, Congress and the judicial branch have created a system of ethics laws and standards for federal judges that lay out the clear rules of the road. These rules promote transparency and disclosure. They place guardrails on conflicts of interest, provide mechanisms for investigation and enforcement, and ensure accountability for misconduct. They strengthen faith in the fairness of the courts and the judges who serve on them. We are here today because the Supreme Court of the United States of America does not consider itself bound by these rules. I invited the Chief Justice to join this conversation. Last week, he sent me a letter declining to testify at today's hearing, and he said, quote, separation of powers concerns and the importance of preserving the judicial independence. The reality is that sitting justices have testified at 92 congressional hearings since 1960. I, and I even offered the Chief Justice the opportunity to designate someone else on the court to testify. But I'm more troubled by the suggestion that testifying to this committee would somehow infringe on the separation of powers or threaten judicial independence. In fact, answering legitimate questions from the people's elected representatives is one of the checks and balances that helps preserve the separation of powers. In his letter last week, the Chief Justice also sent what he called a statement of ethics, principles, and practices. It was a document that was attached to his letter. It is an extraordinary document, not in a good way. It makes clear that while the justices are fine with consulting with certain authorities on how to address ethical issues, they do not feel bound by those same authorities. Much of the document explains why justices think they should not be treated the same as other federal judges when it comes to ethics. And it stresses that recusal decisions are made by individual justices alone with no review of their discretion. The Chief Justice's letter and statement of principles are a defense of the status quo but they are oblivious to the obvious. Last month, we learned about a justice who for years has accepted lavish trips and real estate purchases worth hundreds of thousands of dollars from a billionaire with interest before the court. That justice failed to disclose these gifts and has faced no apparent consequences under the court's ethics principles. That justice claims that lengthy cruises aboard a luxury yacht are personal hospitality and are exempt under current ethical standards from even being reported. The fact that a Texas billionaire paid more than $100,000 for a justice's mother's home also seems to be an acceptable example because the justice insists that he lost money in the transaction. How low can the court go? We are say, one of our witnesses today is going to say that what I just described to you is hallucinating misconduct. I think it's pretty clear to most objective people this is not the ordinary course of business, nor should it be a standard for those of us in public service. We wouldn't tolerate this from a city council member or an alderman. It falls short of ethical standards we expect of any public servant in America. And yet the Supreme Court won't even acknowledge it's a problem. The Chief Justice's letter doesn't mention it. Meanwhile, the rest of the federal judiciary and the executive and legislative branches have codes of conduct designed to prevent even the appearance of fraud, abuse, or corruption. As this chart tells us, the Supreme Court is an outlier on the basics. This is untenable. Ethics cannot simply be left to the discretion of the nation's highest court. The court should have a code of conduct with clear and enforceable rules so both justices and the American people know when conduct crosses the line. The highest court in the land should not have the lowest ethical standards. The, that reality is driving a crisis in public confidence 
in the Supreme Court, the status quo must change. For those who might suggest that my concern is driven by judicial activism against the current court's conservative philosophy, I and other members of this committee wrote the Chief Justice 11 years ago and urged the court to adopt a code of conduct. I'm gonna put the copy of that letter from February 13th, 2012 into the record. The Supreme Court should step up and fix this themselves. For years, they've refused. And because the court will not act, Congress must. Today, we'll hear from a panel of expert witnesses about the kinds of reforms that are needed. And let's be clear, Congress not only has the authority to legislate in this area, but the responsibility. Taxpayers' dollars pay for our federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court. And Congress passes many laws that shape the high court, from the annual spending bills that pay the justice salaries to the federal statute that establishes the words of the oath of office the justices take. I appreciate the Chief Justice responding to my letters and, and responding to questions from my Democratic colleagues that I sent about the statement of principles, but the answers we received further highlight the need for meaningful Supreme Court ethics reform. We have the right and rationale to enact such reform and that's what we will pursue. I wanna say that this hearing is being held jointly with the full committee and the subcommittee on courts chaired by uh, Senator Whitehouse who will uh, join with Senator Kennedy, I believe, in making opening statements. At this time though, I turn it over to the ranking member, Senator Gray.